Gardner talking about white powder gold, one of the most interesting dreamlands I think I can ever remember doing. Upcoming in the new year, we've got all kinds of cool stuff happening. John Hogue, our resident prophet, is going to be back with us, and plus he's going to be in the subscriber section talking to you live uh, about your prophecy ideas and your expectations for the new year. And what does he have to prophesy about your life? Join our live chat with John Hogue as soon as it's scheduled in January. We've got so much going at so many different levels. Dreamland is going to be an exciting year ahead, believe you me. It's nearly, I think it's my ninth year doing Dreamland. It's hard to believe that I've been doing it that long because every week it feels like it's just starting for the first time. And that's what why uh, I love it so much. I'm just fascinated. The things we've got coming up, uh, a new book on catastrophes that explains what actually happened 13,000 years ago that blew this whole planet into a cocked hat. Amazing work of scientists, and this is not speculation at all. Careful scientists have gone around the world examining the debris they will tell us exactly what changed our world so profoundly, what maybe brought about the end of Atlantis. Uh, it, just amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, there's the Blue Pearl uh, meditation up on the website. Don't miss that if you're a subscriber to unknowncountry.com. There's real energy there. And you know, I always talk about 2012, and I say to people, well, people say to me, what's going to happen? And I say, well, maybe... Nothing for most people, but for those who are willing to open their minds, maybe everything. Be willing to open your mind. You know, after I talked to Lawrence Gardner about white powder gold, I took white powder gold for a few weeks, and then nothing seemed to happen. And then a few months after that, a great deal did happen to me, which I've described in my journals and uh, on uh, the show at various times, and it was weird. The only thing about this is there's two things that you've got to realize. First, there's a lot of white powder gold for sale on the Internet. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is, and they don't know necessarily what it is. Some of them perhaps do. We're going to have Lawrence Gardner on again in March. He's got a new book out, and Jim Mars is going to interview him. I'm going to interview him. We're going to have a load of fun. We're going to ask him all the latest about white powder gold. But remember this, any heavy metal that you ingest is dangerous for your kidneys. So don't take a lot of that if you're going to take any of it at all. I mean, I was just tried it for a couple of weeks, and uh, that was it. I was very, very careful with it, and you should be too. I might add for you subscribers that in the subscriber section, there is an interview, a special interview for subscribers only, with Barry Carter, who makes white powder gold and discusses it and his research into it and what it may be and what making of it in entails. It's really fascinating stuff so go to the, well, the way you get to it is you go to the special interviews section then click on the special interviews archive and then search on the word carter at barry carter i think it's from may or no i guess it's from december excuse me of 2003 it's in there and folks those of you who don't subscribe there's a really a wealth of information in that subscriber section Stuff you just absolutely do not see elsewhere, like what I was just talking about. You're never, you won't find that elsewhere. It doesn't exist. So do look for it, uh, those of you who are subscribers and those of you who aren't. Well, click on the subscribe tab and subscribe. You can get Lawrence Gardner's uh, Law Secrets of the Sacred Ark on our website, of course, and you can store, and you will be able to get his new book in March. And it's very exciting stuff. Uh, it's always fun that Lawrence Gardner is coming to come back with us. So let's listen to him now talking about white powder gold from 2003. Introduce you once again to one of the greats. Lawrence Gardner, author of Bloodline of the Holy Grail, has been with us a number of times and it has always been beyond exciting. It's one of those interviews that usually brings me to my feet. Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark is very simply one of the most stunning and, frankly, out-and-out brilliant books I have ever read. This is not going to be a hostile interview. <laughs> I think you can, you can probably sense that. I am over the moon about this book, and Lawrence is a 
a tremendous writer and a tremendous thinker, and he has created in this some extraordinary and exciting insights, and we're going to really have some fun. The subtitle of the book is Amazing Revelations of the Incredible Power of Gold. And, wow, are we going to get into the inner workings of a lost science today. So hang on. Welcome, Lawrence, to the program. Hello there, Whitley. Well, it's so wonderful to have you again. I think that everybody listening to this program knows exactly who Lawrence Gardner is. But just in case there are a few of you out there who don't, do not know what this great leader of this community, this loose community of people willing to tempt the edge of thought and, and exploration, who he is. He is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. He's a constitutional historian, lecturer. He's a broadcaster, as he will be showing you today. He's, a disting he's distinguished as a Chevalier de Saint-Germain. He is attached to the European Council of Princes as the Jacobite Historiographer Royal. He has been a conservation consultant to the Fine Arts Trade Guild, and his work, his musical work, has been performed in London's Royal Opera House, he is a Knight Templar of the Prior of, of St. Anthony and the Prior of the Sacred Kindred of St. Columba. A most extraordinarily unusual Precious Lawrence, also, of course, as well as author of Bloodline of the Holy Grail. He's author of Realm of the Ring Lords and Genesis of the Grail Kings. Now, Lawrence, could you tell me a little bit about what some of these titles actually mean? For example, what is the Chevalier? A, a cheval, the Chevalier de Saint-Germain. What does this mean? It's actually a title which um, has been around for the longest time, actually. The, the first knight of Saint-Germain was um, Robert the Bruce in the year 1307. And subsequently what happened was that um, as the House of Stuart progressed from Robert the Bruce and became the Stuart Kings of Scotland and then Britain, uh, the sort of chief chamberlain to the House of Stuart was always granted that title, um, Saint-Germain title, Count of Saint-Germain, Chevalier Saint-Germain, Knight of Saint-Germain, or whatever. And so in, in a sort of, not exactly a hereditary lineage, but in a lineage of chancellors to, to the House of Stuart, um, I was given the title back in 1992, um, the year that I was appointed to the European Council of Princes to be the sort of key historiographer for the uh, council. And what is the European Council of Princes? It's um, a conglomeration, really, of, of royal houses in Europe. It was founded in 1946 after the Second World War, and, and the object really was that the, the royal houses, whether they were reigning royal houses or past royal houses, deposed or whatever, but the, the, the various... Um, sons really, the princes of the, of the royal houses, got together and formed a council. There was a lot of funding at the time from America, oddly enough, for this. And, and the, the, the ambition was to sort of prevent, again, the rise in Europe of extreme um, political factions like the fascist um, movement that had uh, been battled against at that time, or indeed even communism at the other end, perhaps. Um, and it was called at the time the International Council of Government. Um, what happened was that as time progressed and the European Common Market and then the European Union as it became was formed, a European Parliament emerged. So at that time, um, the, the title was changed um, from the International Council of Government to become the Council of Princes. And what it's actually done really for the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years is to act as a, a constitutional advisory body. Um, if, for example, the Brussels Parliament issues a dictate to the countries in the European Union, uh, it's the council that will sit in judgment really and sort of look at the various constitutions of the countries involved and go back and say, well look, you can implement that here, but you can't implement it there because the constitution doesn't allow you to. So I it's, see. it's an advisory council. I see. Well, in any case, it's, it's absolutely fascinating and it's a most most interesting and unusual uh, process. I can't resist and I, I want to get right to the meat of the book, but a Knight Templar of St. Anthony, what is that? It's very possibly, and I'm not absolutely sure, but it's probably 
about the oldest order of Knights Templars currently um, still operating. And it was founded in the time of Mary Queen of Scots for Mary Queen of Scots. So it's a branch of the Knights Templars that was set up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. In fact, originally it was set up in France because she was Queen of France for a while um, before she came to Scotland. And then um, it became the sort of key Scottish order of Knights Templars in, in the 1500s. Well, we will be getting, of course, later in the, in, the, in the interview very deeply into the whole matter of the Knights Templar, and we will be getting into it with a man who knows his, certainly knows his, his stuff. But let's begin by going back 99 years and many thousands of years at the same time. Sir W.M. Flinders Petrie stood upon a wind-torn rocky plateau in the Sinai Desert, Thus begins a story that eclipses Indiana Jones completely with a much more extraordinary truth. What was he doing there, Lawrence? Well, Petrie at that time, at the beginning of the 1900s, was probably um, Britain's foremost archaeologist. Archaeology was fairly new. There had only been archaeologists for about 50 years prior to that, and he was the sort of key man of the time. He was uh, primarily an Egyptologist, um, but as Sinai historically had always been a part of Egypt in, in olden times, um, in the times of ancient Egypt, he, he was selected really by the Egypt Exploration Society to go out to Sinai, the, the, the peninsula that sort of sits alongside the, the Red Sea, the, the triangular landmass there. And um, the object really was to sort of survey the country in general uh, for the Exploration Society and in particular to, to look at mining in the area and, and that sort of thing. It was a turquoise mining area particularly and copper mining was done there. So he was going to survey the country. So he took a, a team of um, chaps out there in 1904 and, and he decided that, that while he was there, one of the things that they would do is to follow the directions in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, and to actually explore the mountain of Moses while he was there. Um, so he got the directions, and, and the first thing that he discovered was that, that the mountain that the Bible led him to, led the team to, was not the mountain that is actually today called Mount Sinai, which sits at the bottom of the peninsula. Um, that particular mountain got its name in the 4th century from a a group of Greek um, Christian monks who decided it was a jolly good place to set up a monastery. Uh -huh. but, um, anyway, so they so set the monastery up and then claimed the provenance. That's right, yeah. Mountain, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely little monastery. It's got a lo lovely art collection there. It's, it's really quite nice, but it's in the wrong place. Uh, the actual mountain is much further north in, in the country, and if you think about it, if they were traveling across Sinai, uh, from Egypt to get to the land of Canaan, Palestine, they w would never have had to go <laughs> way down to the bottom of Sinai to do that. So they would have travelled much more um, across across country uh, to do to do that. So anyway, he found the mountain, Mount Horeb, um, as it's called in the Bible. In fact, it doesn't get called Mount Sinai for a while. It's called Mount Horeb, yes. um, effectively, in the Bible. And he got there and he found the mountain and he thought, well, this is a very exciting discovery, actually. I think this is the place. And this um, this, uh, this word Horeb or, or Horeb is uh, a very important word. It, shall we? Do you want to discuss it just parenthetically now, or will we go well, back? Well, yes, actually, I, I might as well because um, not that I think he probably knew it at the time, but um, the, the, the the original word um, Horeb was spelt with a C. It was C H O R E B, and the C was silent. Uh, so in English translation, that it became H O R E B, but it was pronounced Horeb, spelt Choreb. Uh, and in actual fact, um, in in the more Greek, Greco-Roman spelling of the word, it was not Choreb but Cherub, as in Cherub, as in angel Cherub, um, which came from uh, the Semitic word Cherub, beginning with a, 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 a Q or a K, and the word meant flight. Which is interesting. So it was the mountain of flight. Um, the in, mountain in real of term. flight. Well, that that is going to definitely tie into what we're going to be discussing. Mm. Uh, don't think for a minute this is an ordinary discussion about the past. This is a discussion about the past by a man who knows a lot of secrets. So, back to the mount. Sir Flinders Petrie stands on the mountain of flight without knowing quite 
what it is and what, what happens next. Okay, well, he decided, as all good explorers must, that having got there, it would be jolly nice to climb to the top. And in fact, since they were surveying the country, and it was a pretty high mountain, it ro rose to about, oh, two and a half, little over two and a half thousand feet above sea level. So he took the team up to the top. And what they discovered when they got very, very close to the top was that it flattened out before the sort of pointy bit. And there's this wonderful great plateau. And um, it w was covered in rubble, but out of the rubble he could see various standing stones and pillars and various things protruding. So they then spelt, spent weeks and weeks up this place, um, got the Bedouin, local Bedouins to help them, and they cleared all this rubble. And lo and behold, they found an ancient Egyptian temple of quite enormous size, about 270 feet on the plateau. This thing came out from the mountain, and then there was a cave at the other end, and it went back a considerable way into the mountain as a sort of inside part of the temple. So it was astonishing. In fact, it was, it was mammoth by any Egyptian standard. Uh, and there was this temple, two and a half thousand feet up a mountain. And... Um, so having, having cleared it, they, they started to sort of explore it in general and uh, found all sorts of amazing things. So, I mean, the furniture was still there. There were altars and there were tables and, uh, and, and various things of that sort. There, there you were mean wooden furniture? Or hmm? Wooden furniture? Was it that well preserved? No, or? no, it was stone. It was stone. Stone, stone yeah. altars. Every, everything there was stone. It was stone altars, stone tables. Uh, but what, what struck him as rather odd was the, the shape of these things. They weren't actually shapes like church altars one might imagine them to be. They had sort of re recessed fronts on them. They had split level surfaces. Um, and they looked really more like um, workbenches of some sort. And they, they found all sorts of very strange items there, including crucibles, metallurgist crucibles, and, and, and things that generally didn't seem to belong in a church. Well, subsequently, what actually happened was that, that once he was back and, and uh, the linguists got hold of a lot of the stuff, to cut a long story short, the, the, the word that we now have as worship is really the interesting word. Uh, and I checked this out with the Oxford Word Library, and we ch checked it right back to its origin and found that actually the word worship only really entered the English language as such in about the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, the word was workship. Workship. Work and workship was carried out in workshops called temples. So what was discovered was, in actual fact, a, it was a mammoth discovery, actually, because it was discovered there that, that temples in those times were different to churches. They were not about venerating gods. They were about working for gods or working for kings. And the priests had amazing names. The priests were called things like the Great Artificer or the Great Vulcan, that sort of thing. You know, the titles that seemed to have um, very alchemical rings to them or, or the rings of a workshop rather than yes. the rings of a church, you know. It's beginning to sound like we're not even talking about a temple in the sense that we mean, but by about a place that has other dimensions as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, subsequent to that, looking again, as they did at temples in um, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, this same sort of theme seemed to follow, although nobody had ever really clued into it before, because it was thought that these were places of, of veneration, of religion, and they weren't about religion as such. They were about working for the masters, whoever the masters were, whether they were the kings or the gods or whatever. And... Um, it was really a question of, of trying to work out what they did in this workshop, in this temple, this massive temple. Um, there were reliefs all over the walls, um, carvings. There, there were carvings on obelisks. There were carvings on standing stones. And all of these things were quite astonishing because that the whole place was dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Hathor. And it seemed to be related totally to gold. It was called the House of Gold. The inscriptions kept saying, this is the House of Gold. There were uh, relief carvings there of, of the treasurers, and the treasurers were called the great guardians or the overseers of the House of Gold. 
and in the portrayals they're, they're shown sort of making presentations of of what look like cakes conical cakes to the to the pharaohs and um the age of this thing was quite enormous it actually the the inscriptions go right back from the 18th dynasty around the time of moses and akhenaten that sort of period mm -hmm. 1300 bc that sort of time frame and they go right back to about 2600 2700 bc and now, um, that is really that's it was deep astonishingly in the old yeah. Yeah. Before uh, the break, even between the two kingdoms. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's before the era that the pyramids are attributed to. Um, this sort of two and a half thousand year period, and, and so it was the fourth dynasty that, that seemed to actually establish this temple. And, and, and how long did the temple continue to function? Well, it functioned from from about two thousand six hundred BC to about thirteen hundred BC. So you're looking at um, a considerable time span there. Yeah, um, over a thousand years. That's right, yeah. And all the time through that, each pharaoh had his, his own statues there or his relief carvings, and each of them showed the various pharaohs being presented with these strange bread cakes. And the bread cakes had a name, and they called them mufkuts. The hieroglyph translated to M-F-K-Z-T. Yeah, when I saw that word in the book, I thought, oh, my goodness, I hope he pronounces it before I have to. Oh, well, I, I mean, <laughs> nobody really knows. I spoke to the Egypt Exploration Society, and they said, well, you know, you can throw in whatever vowels you like, really. It's M-F-K-Z-T. Yeah, right, um, whatever vowels you need to make the word yeah, work. So yeah, so, I, I mean, generally, I just put a couple of U's in it, and it sounds as good as anything because it kind of says what it is. Right. But they didn't know what Mufkuts was. They had no idea what it was. Whenever they found the word, it seemed to be related to these cakes, these, these sort of presentation bread-looking things. And um, alongside them was generally the hieroglyph for light, you know, the sort of the circle with the dot in the middle, the light symbol that Egyptians use. So, yes. so this mufkut seemed to be related to light. It seemed to be related to bread. And um, there were these conical cakes there. Well, interestingly, uh, and this didn't happen until afterwards, but at the Temple of Karnak in in, um, in Egypt, th th there's a wonderful relief there um, w which shows the treasures of, of Pharaoh Thutmosis III. Uh, and it, it's a brilliant uh, relief because it's actually got the shelves, and laid out on these shelves are all his treasures in, in a relief form. And underneath them, it tells you what they are. And on one of the shelves, there is a whole line of these conical things, just the same as they were finding at um, the temple in Sinai. And it actually explains underneath them, and, and these are within the gold section. There's a silver section and a gold section and a gem section on, on the shelves. And they're within the gold section, and it says, these are the cones of white bread, and they are made of gold. So, the thing kind of tied together. The house of gold... The cakes, the conical shaped cakes, the presentations, the overseers of the House of Gold, and and the fact that the bread cakes said to be the made of gold. Of the bread cakes. made of gold, something well, made you of can gold, eat, yeah. In other words, that's actually made of gold. That's right, except they were white, so positively white in color. So now, has any of this white substance ever been found? We, well, yeah, I mean Pet Petri actually made the discovery at that time, I mean, what he didn't know was that, that some of it had been found before, but um, the, the the thing that, that, that clued him in really was the story of Moses from the book of Exodus. And he was on the mountain of Moses, and the story, the strange story in Exodus, which precedes the um, the Israelites moving on from the mountain, and it's the story which relates to the Ark of the Covenant and all of the fire and brimstone that was going on at the mountain. And, and what happened was that when Moses came down from the mountain, having apparently um, uh, got the Ten Commandments, he came down and discovered that in his absence, his brother and the Israelites had got a little fed up with hanging around. And um, so his brother had collected up all the gold, all the earrings and, and various gold bands and whatever from the Israelites, melted this gold down and made as an idol of worship a golden calf. Now that's fairly straightforward. It, it upset Moses, but there's nothing odd about that. Right. But the next bit of the story is very odd. 
And the next bit of the story is, and remember, this is this is taking place at the mountain where Petri is now standing. Mm. The next bit of the story says, and when Moses saw the golden calf, he took it from his brother, he confiscated it, he burns it with fire, he transposed it into powder, mixed it in water, and fed it to the Israelites. And the, the baffling thing about that, the, the thing that really made me wonder and has made other scholars wonder, I suppose, in the past, is that it doesn't really matter how you heat gold, whether you do it slowly or fiercely. If you heat gold, you get molten gold. You certainly right. don't get powder. No. I, and so there was the anomaly. The anomaly was that at this house of gold, at this mountain, Petra is there, he is looking at these bread cakes, he knows they're made of gold, uh, they're white, they're conical, they're very, very valuable, they're presented to the kings, and the kings in- ingest them for, for whatever reason. And um, the Moses story is the same. Yes. The gold turns into powder, powder. and is used as a food supplement. And now, he took in the fact... Cat. Let, me, the, let me just read the, 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 from Exodus 32.20, as you have it in, in the book. Uh, and he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. That is exactly what this ritual punishment or ritual action was as described in Exodus. So now go ahead, Lawrence. Well, I mean, it sounds, doesn't it, when you read that, as if it's some sort of a punishment, really. I mean, that's that's the way it reads. Um, but, But in effect... Um, what seems to have been the case was that, that the white powder of gold, which was highly valuable, highly venerated, was fed to the kings and the pharaohs and the high priests in a particular manner. It was either turned into little cakes and eaten, or it was mixed with water and drunk. And um, so what Moses was really doing there was 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 not punishing anybody. He, he was introducing them to something um, that that maybe he knew about, and maybe they didn't, or perhaps they even did. Uh, but this was a custom. It was a ritual, and it, it it transpires that that this material, this white powder, this white powder of gold, um, seemed to have quite amazing qualities when ingested. And the qualities were that, and this is the reason why it was given to the senior people was that it was supposed to heighten certain qualities of leadership. It would, uh, it would heighten awareness. It would heighten perception. It would heighten powers of judgment, that sort of thing. And it was also reckoned to have the power of active longevity, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that it makes one live longer, but the word active is important because what it seems to mean is that even though one might die at the age one was anticipating to die, you probably wouldn't have contracted any terrible disease. You might have just died from old age because that's as old as you got. Um, but it seems to have a healing quality to it. So it, so it allowed uh, active physical abilities to, to move on much later in, in life. Um, and, and in fact, when one considers the Bible stories, we, we've got some extraordinarily um, great ages in there. I'm not really talking about the, those very early on in the story where, where people seem to live for hundreds of years. Right. But even, you know, in, in the sort of latter part of it as we move on, the kings do seem to be leading troops into battle when they're in their 70s and 80s, when, they, when they're really quite elderly and, and would generally be considered to be past it. So, so clearly this, this had some very positive effect. Anyway, what Petri did was that they, they searched this place and... Um, the temple itself, the, the sort of outside part of the temple, in fact all of it was built on this plateau. It was a sandstone plateau. So there was no floor laid down anywhere. It was just, just a plateau. The, the, the mountain was the floor. But then there was a, a series of, of small storerooms. Well, they appeared like storerooms. And when they went into them, and they clearly weren't as important as the bigger halls and shrines, but their floors were covered with heavy flagstones. And they thought, well, this is really quite odd. So they lifted the flagstones, and lo and behold, beneath the flagstones was an amazingly preserved um, lot of pure, white, unadulterated powder. Um, Petri reckoned that there were many tons of it. 
and they tried everything. They sieved it, they winnowed it, they gave it every test that they could, trying to find whatever foreign matter might be in it, whether perhaps it was the result of sacrificial ritual or, or whether it was the, from the burning of plants to get alkalines or, or whatever, but there was nothing. What, whatever they did, it just went through the sieves, fine mesh sieves, nothing there at all, just white powder. And gradually the picture came together. The muffcuts, the cakes, the bread, the gold, the powder were all one and the same. And this temple, this workshop, seems to have been primarily there for the manufacturer of this material. And where the material that was found there, there was a lot of it found, at over a ton, as I recall. Oh, many, many tons, many actually, tons. he reckoned. I mean, you know, has, this way been, has this material been tested in modern times? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that material, in, in actual fact, what happened was that, that we're, we're outside the, the we're, we're on the plateau now, we've got these rooms, but the, the tops are off, you know, the, the bits of walls are there, the flagstones right. are there, but there's no roof on the thing. So only what happened was that they lifted all these flagstones and stood them up against the walls. And um, really, I mean, they, they didn't regard this stuff as anything terribly special. In fact, at, at one point in time, they thought it was just there to sort of level off the flagstones, as one night they sand underneath paving stones today, except that there was no reason for the stones to be there. So they, they just bagged up a, a, a bunch of it in, into a box or a paper bag or whatever it was that they had, and, and that was eventually sent back to the British Museum in London for testing. And um, then they came down from the mountain eventually and just left everything as it was. And that was in 1904. Mm -hmm. um, by the time the next expedition went there, which was in 1935, which was an expedition led by Harvard University, uh, that was the end of the white powder. It had been open for all of that time to the desert winds and the storms and the rain and everything had got to it. So oh. it was totally obliterated by then. And, but the story of the, the, the material that was sent back was quite interesting because um, although, again, nobody paid too much interest to it, um, the test results on it um, were fairly simple chemical tests, actually. I mean, there was nothing terribly um, uh, difficult done, but, but the tests on it um, showed it to be the same materials as the white powder that have been found in the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid. And what were those materials? They were basically silica um, and um, various things, silica, feldspar, mica, uh, iron, aluminium, in, in essence. So that's basically what it tests as. Now, the, the interesting thing with that is, and I'll, I'll just pop this in now for the, for the sake of it, when one manufactures this material now, starting with gold, real gold, and what, there are various methods to manufacture it, but one of the methods to manufacture it is by electronic arcing. Now, this is very interesting because we have the Ark of the Covenant, which turns out to be an electronic capacitor. Oh, um, my. Capable of, of really, in fact, the... the um, the, the power of it generated its storage capability would have been something like 40 to 50,000 volts, so it would have been enormously powerful. Um, but, but oddly enough, what happens is when you make this material, and in fact it's, it's a monatomic material, you shock the gold, you shock it so that the atoms become totally confused and they fall apart and they become a powder. They can't join together anymore They're to become metal. They're simply a powder because you've shocked the hell out of them. Um, now, when you've done that and you subject it to chemical analysis or even spectroscopic analysis, what it tells you is that it's silica, mica, aluminium, iron, sometimes bits of calcium, exactly the same. And, and that's the weird thing about monatomic substances, it seems, that once they become monatomic, they do not register as metal anymore. At all. Not at all. And interestingly, one other little thing I'll just pop in here, which isn't in the book. They had the University of Washington in St. Louis, and NASA have been working for the past few years on retrieving from the ionosphere a substance which they are calling stardust. stardust. Now, this stardust comes from beyond our solar system. They're finding it at the ratio of about six particles 
to 100,000 particles of all other cosmic dust. So that it's very rare even up there. But this stuff tests as exactly the same. And what they're wow. saying is, they're saying that they feel that this stardust is going to be, because it emanates from what they say is a metal-rich supernova explosion, um, that they feel that, that this stardust will eventually be one of the, the key clues uh, to the, the sort of root of, of the life force on this planet. My word. So it's quite extraordinary. <laughs> I should say, well, we can, I can hardly wait to get back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Lawrence Gardner. We have been discussing a strange white powder that proves to come from two places, ancient Egypt and outer space. Now, Lawrence, the question has to be asked, since this was called bread, and it's clear that Moses made his people drink it, in a, drink it in liquid fluid form what did it do exactly to people when they consumed it and have you since it can be made now have you ever tried any um what it what it seemed to do i mean as i mentioned earlier it it, it apparently had the powers to sort of um enhance the qualities which they required from their kings and their their high priests and their leaders in general uh, now, re more recently, uh, it, it's become um, a little more apparent w precisely what happens in, in that this um, material can, can be made not just from gold, but from metals of the platinum group. So we're looking really at gold, at platinum, at palladium, at iridium, ruthenium, rhodium, and osmium. So these are the metals that primarily one can manufacture this substance from. It can also be done with copper and um, nickel and one or two other metals, but, but mainly it's the, it's the platinum groups and the gold. Now, what's been discovered is that it depends upon the metal, but it begins by being quite what it might do. But it's a little bit like, if, if, if you think about sort of, vitamins that people take and if they take a multivitamin it will do all sorts of things at once but if they take just A or just B it's for a designated purpose and this seems to be the case with, with this material um, the monatomic powder made from gold for example seems to have its main effect on the pineal gland and what it does is that it actually enhances the operation of the gland uh, so that it produces more of its hormone. And the secreted hormone from, from the pineal gland is, is melatonin. Um, iridium, for example, on, on the other hand, seems to have an effect on the pituitary gland in particular. And um, the pituitary gland is, is responsible for producing serotonin. So, so in, in effect, what, what appears to be the case is that these different metals um, seem to have their various actions on different glands in the endocrinal system. Mm -hmm. And they were related to, to what we, in, in today's terms, call, call the chakra system through the body, uh, which, which for the most part are sort of related to this sort of glandular structure within the body. And even the ancient tree of life was drawn up on that sort of a basis when it was graphically drawn. Um, it, it sort of shown with these sort of glandular power points in it. And so what, what, what would be the case would be that the, the, the gold or the other metals would be used to produce what, what might actually be vitamins A, B, C, and D, or they could be mixed together to produce the multi. <laughs> and it might well be um, that it was more common to use the multi than we think because although platinum group metals uh, weren't, supposedly discovered, if you look in any encyclopedia, until the 1840s, all of the old texts talk about a white metal, which they called firestone. Uh, it was a white metal. What, what was always known was that it was a silvery-colored, valuable metal. And because platinum hadn't been discovered, 
uh, people through um, out the sort of medieval alchemist times and whatever. Everybody thought that it must be tin or mercury or something of that sort. And so they were doing all their experiments with the wrong things. Now, the moment platinums were discovered, and certainly throughout the last few decades, um, even doing some of the old alchemical experiments using platinum has a completely different result to using mercury, which was poisoning everybody. And um, so it rather seems that they were using gold and platinums uh, to produce this material. I want to get. I want to go in a slightly different direction now. Uh, I was very interested in the early part of the book. You mentioned that the um, that there is a relief at Abydos uh, uh, at of Anubis sitting on an ark, mm. while uh, the Pharaoh presents a conical loaf of this material. Yeah. And I was so interested in the fact that this was in this particular temple, and I was thinking about Mount Horeb being called the Mountain of Mount of, mountain of flight, and of course the, there's a rafter in that temple that contains some very extraordinary images indeed yes. that seem to be of modern uh, technological equipment, tanks and yeah. aircraft and so forth, and I wondered then what the secret of Anubis might be and uh, that the that he presides over the dead in the afterlife, but uh, the journey into the afterlife. But what if that was actually a journey of a very different kind, and maybe someone from that era had actually seen these things yeah. and brought back? I, I just wonder if you could sort of comment on all. I, I know this is a very unformed question, and I apologize. No, I, for I mean, that. It's, it's, it's a good question, Whitley. I, it, I, I don't really know any more than anybody else does about the nature of, of, of those particular um, carvings. That they're totally intriguing. Um, but Anubis certainly um, was associated with the afterlife of, of the pharaohs. And interestingly, um, remember we've... we've this material was called by the Egyptians. I mean, they had different names for it. The Babylonians used to call it Shemana, uh, highwood firestone, that means. The Egyptians called it Muscots. Now, if you look at the pyramid texts at, at Saqqara, um, they, they, they refer to a dimension. I mean, for want of a better word, a dimension or a plane of existence of some sort in which the pharaohs are said to live with the gods, and they call that dimension the field of muskets. So, in as much as that, that, that Anubis is clearly associated with this, and we see the pharaoh presenting one of these bread cakes actually to, to, to the uh, jackal gods sitting on, on, on an ark, actually, um, it, it rather seems that, that the material itself, the muskets, was very much to do not just with the pharaoh's life and with his own active longevity, etc., but also with the afterlife. Um, in whatever form they, they imagined it, they called it the field of Muscat. And it was quite apparent that although the pharaoh was deemed to be dead here on earth, that they figured that he was going to be living with the gods in this field of Muscat, as, as it states. Um, an interesting scenario emerges because what, what modern science has now discovered is, is that this stuff has some really remarkable properties, I mean, truly remarkable. It's, um, it's superconductive. It will travel in frequencies. It will harness energy and hold energy and transport energy. It will travel in light waves. It's anti-gravitational, or it can be made anti-gravitational so that it levitates, and it also has the power within it to resonate in different dimensions of space-time so that it becomes totally and utterly invisible. And um, what struck me as amazing was that in the tests that have been done, for example, in the anti-gravity tests, it does seem to have the power to transfer its own weightlessness to whatever it's on. In the laboratory situation, for example, it would be in a pan sitting on a set of scales. 
Uh, and, and once it had moved into a sort of a weightless, weightless a zero gravity state, the pan itself was actually weighing less than it did before the powder was put into it. My word. And, and so, one, it has this power of levitation. Now, following from that, if you keep on heating this stuff, uh, carry on heating it, it gets lighter and lighter, and it reaches a point where it will totally disappear from sight. And the um, Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, in Texas, there, Yes, I know how put made, off made there the very well. That, yeah, that it was, at that stage, it would be resonating in a different dimension, at which point it would become totally invisible. And, um, yeah, this is this seems to be the case. And, and what made me wonder about this, it was just a, a thought, and it's a, a scenario, really, rather than a proof of anything, but my mind went back to the field of Mufkuts in which the pharaohs were said to live in the afterlife. It went back to the old kingdom pharaohs, none of whose bodies have ever been found, it went back to the empty sarcophagus that was found in the Great Pyramid and the fact that all this sarcophagus had in it was a scattering of this white powder. And it's entirely possible, although I, I've not known the experiment to be done, but in fact, what scientists are working on now, certainly in stealth aircraft technology, and they're doing this at the Phantom works at Boeing in Seattle, they're doing it here at British Aerospace and various places are working on new stealth technology. And the object is to use superconductive mechanisms to make stealth aircraft not just anti-gravitational, not just undetectable by radar, as they are now, but to make them totally invisible by moving them in a different parallel dimension of space-time. Now, if modern science is looking at the possibility of this and considers that, yes, it is a possibility, then it might just be that the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians knew exactly about that. They may not have understood it, they would have had different names for it, but they might just have had the ability to transpose things into other dimensions of space-time, and that might just have been where, where these old kingdom pharaohs went to. Now, let me ask you this. I, uh, we touched on this a moment ago, but I am absolutely fascinated, of course, with th the idea of getting some of this myself and trying it on myself. Um, uh, it, now, before you answer the question as to whether or not it's available and safe, etc., and if you've ever tried it, we want to take a little break. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Lawrence Gardner, author of Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, Amazing Revelations of the Incredible Power of Gold. And before we went on our break and listened to a lovely commercial about your book, uh, we were a I was asking you about the availability of this substance and if you've tried it. Okay. Um there are two ways for the substance to be available. One is that it can be manufactured directly from gold or from the platinum group metals. The other is that it can be found in uh, sets of natural circumstances. I mentioned earlier the, the stardust that uh, right. NASA and Washington University are, are working on. And they have said that this material is identical to some small grain particles that they found in deep seabeds. Now, in fact, not only in deep seabeds, but sometimes um, in, in old volcano sites this stuff has been found, uh, it, it seems to be that there is a natural formation of monatomic elements in certain parts of the Earth caused by meteorites. Now, if you take a metal, for example, like iridium, one of the platinum group, Iridium is not native to this earth at all. It's only an extraterrestrial metal. It is only brought in by meteorites. So when one finds the sort of rare iridium seams that there are, uh, which is why it's so expensive, what we have is a situation where meteorites have just plunged it down into, into the earth. However, mm -hmm. on other occasions, <coughs> what seems to have happened is that 
when, when these meteorites come, come into the Earth's atmosphere, they, they burn up, they get enormously hot, and on impact, it can actually implode the iridium within them and break it down into a monatomic substance. So one can find monatomic substances, as some people have in, in certain farm soils or, or, or in other sites, certainly down in the Gulf of Mexico on the seabed there, in the Dead Sea in Israel, that this, this stuff is apparent. So the question on how to, how to get it is that there are two ways the material can be obtained. One, it can be obtained in a manufactured form directly from the metals, which is very expensive, or it can be obtained um, in a way whereby the trace elements have been collected from these sites. And um, there are a number of companies on, on, on the Internet now, I mean, they've just sort of appeared over the last few years, that, that are, are advertising this sort of product. Now, I can't really make recommendations at this stage. I'm no. not having um, certain, certain of the products tested. I, I've got the Elements and Materials Department at Oxford University working on it right now, and they are gaining a little help from Harwell Laboratories here in, in Oxford. And um, I, I'm just looking at the makeup of these substances. What I'm, what I'm interested to see is, is that what I know that they should test as silica, um, aluminum, calcium, iron, uh, that they do test as these substances. And um, so on that basis, what I'm planning to do in the not-too-distant future is, is, is to put um, a, a, a few of these items on my website, not, not for sale or even as recommendations, but simply to say, look, here are the different ways it could be obtained, and these are ones I've had tested, and these are a good product. Now, whether they're going to... Uh, do all the things for one that the, the, the Babylonians and the Egyptians said they would, I don't really know. But there have been some people testing these over the past um, few years, and they've had some quite extraordinary results. Uh, copper, for example, monatomic copper is quite extraordinary. Um, there are two or three cases that I, that I know of um, where in a period of just a year or so, uh, of regular ingestion of, of monatomic copper, that, that guys with, with grey hair have gone back to their normal colour. Um, those taking some of the platinum group monatomic elements um, have experienced all sorts of things. Um, skin seems to tighten up in older age. Baggy eyes seem to disappear, that sort of thing. I and mean, generally, they do seem to have a, a sort of a youth-giving effect. Um, but... Clearly, you know, what, what, what the case was in olden times was that once embarked on this, it was very regular and it was permanent. It wasn't something that you just did for a couple of months and expected wonders to happen. It was a, a long-term process. Now, I've not actually um, tried any of it myself at the moment, although I've got a number of samples that I've collected over the years. And I also, when I first started being interested in this back in 1997, I was over there in the States and was actually present when some of it was made from a Canadian maple leaf coin and whatever. So I got to know the, the, the process. What I'm going to do is once I finish these tests, I've decided my, my, I've got a birthday coming up in just a few weeks' time, and that'll be an easy date to remember for logging. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a go from, from, from I'm going to pick the one that I'm going to, to try and, um, and, and, and see what happens. Um, I mean, my, my, my real interest in it is, is not so much uh, about... Um, the, the ingestion, you know, I mean, if one buys it and it's made from gold or from platinum, then it can cost quite a lot of money. Yes. And really, you know, if one seems to think it's being taken to live a few years longer, well, you know, that, that could cost you a lot of dollars a week for the privilege. Right. <laughs> it might not work. So I, I don't know. But there are other extraordinary medical attributes to it. For example, the Platinum um, Metals Review uh, published an article not long ago and they made the point in, in their article that if you take one atom, one single atom of ruthenium, which is um, a, a monatomic state piece of ruthenium, and you place this atom on the end of a DNA strand within the body's cellular structure, you just go to the helix and you put this on, what it does is to dismantle the DNA strand. It is a monatomic substance. It will dismantle it the It dismantles strand, it. And it will enable it to rebuild itself. But it will only rebuild itself in accordance with its memory. DNA strands have memory. They're like yeah. things in the computer. Now, the interesting thing about this, and what seems to be interesting the, the medical fraternity, is that 
if you have a malformed cell, if you have uh, a, a deformed DNA, and you do this to it, it will not rebuild itself in a deformed state. It will only rebuild itself as it should be in accordance with its memory. Now, this is the greatest ever potential cure for cancer because cancer is nothing more than deformed cell structures. It's exactly what it is. It's based on a malformed DNA. So if you can actually, without surgery, without drugs, without radiation, if you can actually um, repair cancerous cells and put them back to a normal state by use of this sort of process, then actually that to me is, is, is worth all the research that's ever been done on it. Because, I mean, it doesn't really matter about ingesting it and bread cakes and things like that, but no. that alone would be astonishing. And they're now working on, on a, a nanotechnology which is producing body-roaming computers that are so small they can fit within a full stop at the end of a sentence. They're tiny, tiny little things. And they can roam about the body, and they're the sort of machines that will actually be able to make these atomic placements. And um, so we're looking forward to something quite exciting on that front. It'll be a little while before it gets to the forefront of, of, of our general press and, and, and media, but um, it, it, it'll happen, and, and it will be a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to cure a, you know, the last bad disease that we've got by that means without surgery. It occurs to me that maybe those enormous longevities m mentioned in the Bible were not lunar uh, related to the lunar cycle, as people now think, but actually were annular. Well, it, it's possible. I mean, it, it's ever so difficult to say, isn't it, really? And I, you yeah, know, I don't have to so. hang my hat on anything, but the, it, it, it seems it's not just in the Bible. You know, it's in old Mesopotamian texts and whatever. There, there seems to have been an ability through a particular period of time um, for at least those in positions of power, if not everybody, we're looking at the kings, the sort of patriarchs of nations and those sort of people, to actually have quite incredibly long lifespans. Right. And, um, I mean, who knows? It, it, it might just be that people could have lived for hundreds of years. I mean, actually, when you think about it, um, we're, we're looking at substances here that have effects on bodily hormone secretions. Um, by doing that, it, but they will, by virtue of their, their, their very nature, have an effect on enzymes within the body. Now, the aging process within you or me or anyone is, is really caused by the, the lack of production of an enzyme called telomerase. And telomerase is, is, is quite extraordinary. As we grow, what happens is that our cells keep dividing. They divide and they become two. And then the, each of the two divides and becomes four. And so it goes on and then other ones die off. We keep replicating these cells. And it happens by, by virtue of that the, 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 the cell structure contains something a little bit like the, the plastic bit on the end of a shoelace. They're called telomeres. And as each time they divide, the telomeres get shorter because each cell has half of what was there before. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter until they reach an optimum and critical length. And that's the point at which we start to go downhill and get older. Instead yes. of, uh, well, get, get, I mean, age rather than growing. Right. So we move into a sort of a reverse pattern. Uh, now, it's, it's been um, calculated in actual fact that, that as long as we can enhance and produce more telomerase, then what actually happens is that the telomeres don't shorten at such a critical rate. A telomerase, for example, is very, very rich in mother's milk. It, it's a, a primary enzyme for feeding children. Uh, males carry it in, in their reproductive systems, but, but it's not part of our body as such. We just lose it as we get older. But if this material, uh, the, these white powder substances, if monatomic substances actually have an effect, and it's not known yet, if they have an effect on enzyme production in just the same way that they do on hormonal production, then 
the answer to the question is yeah. They really could have an effect on, on lifespan in quite a tremendous way because as long as they're pro- helping the body to produce more of this particular enzyme, the telomeres won't shorten in the way that they actually do and, and it'll be a lot longer before we plateau out to reach the stage where we stop growing and start declining. It's absolutely fascinating. It's quite awesome. And let's, let's now talk a little bit about the the science that must have gone into this in the distant past, because we are talking, after all, about a pretty sophisticated process uh, in terms of creating the substance in the first place, a process much more sophisticated than we give the Egyptians credit for uh, in terms of their technological capabilities. Now, I have to ask you, there is a, a picture in the book. And, oh, by the way, the listeners... This book is marvelously illustrated. Like all of Lawrence's books, it is just a a magnificent uh, production from a production standpoint. It's lovely. And I'm looking at one of the beautiful pictures in it now. And this is, of course, the relief at the Temple of Hathor in Dendera that you have of this object that seems to have a serpent in it Mm. And, uh, and then there's another one being held by what looked like a one. One is being held up by it could be a gigantic vacuum tube even. Yeah. But what interests me so much about this is the relationship between the serpent and the soul, and why, in particular, if it is a vacuum tube, it would contain a serpent. What is going on in this picture? I've always wondered. If there's anyone in the world who can tell us, you can. <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I have my own oh, thoughts on it, but many people have. Um, they're, they're odd, these objects. I mean, they, these are enormous reliefs um, down in the depths of the, the, the temple of Hathor at Dendera. Now, interestingly, Hathor's other temple is the temple at Mount Horeb in Sinai. And so the two places are linked without any doubt at all. And this is where Petrie was, and Dendera is the, the other temple of Hathor. Now, most of the, well, in fact, all of the above ground part of that temple was, was rebuilt in, in Roman times, but the, the crypt area um, wasn't really emptied of sand until fairly recent times, actually. And these magnificent and enormous reliefs became apparent on the walls. and, and they show these sort of priestly characters holding in front of them what look to be like enormous cathode tubes, don't they? Like cathode ray tubes. Great big bubble things with serpents inside. And, uh, you know, if one looks at the height of, of the man, that they seem to be about two, and, two to two and a half men in length, these things. So they're obviously quite light, whatever they are, you know, because he's just sort of holding them out in a couple of hands and they've got a bit of a support underneath them. Now, people have uh, suggested all sorts of things. That there are those who um, think that they're part of some strange serpent cult. There are others who said that they're electric light bulbs. Um, there seems to be a lot of, of, of thought that they could in some way be related to electricity because they seem to have cables coming from them of yes. some sort, and they run to sort of a box on which sits uh, a god. Um, there are others who, who really have homed in, as I think I probably did in the first instance, so thinking about um, uh, Röntgen rays and things like that, X-rays. They really do look like cathode ray tubes. But it, it's kind of interesting that the more I thought about it, the more I couldn't figure what any of that had to do with Hathor, and these were clearly Hathor things. The serpent was often used, the serpent was always a symbol of healing, it was a, it, it was um, a, a symbol of energy, really. It mm-hmm. was a symbol for the wise men and for the doctors. It was an energy symbol or a, a wise man symbol. Now, the interesting thing about these um, tubes is that, that there are other people apart from the priests who seem to be sitting or standing in a supportive position. Now, some of them seem to have their hands underneath the tube, supporting the tube, and others seem to have their hands and arms just going into the body of the tube, as one might perhaps be able to go into a soap bubble if it didn't burst. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that the snakes change. The snakes um, within 
the tubes that have the hands supporting the tubes are different in shape to those where the hands go into the tubes. And sometimes the snakes are, have uh, seven bends in them, seven, seven um, uh, well, waves, really, and other times they have five. Now, the energy seems to change uh, with whether the hands are inside the tube or outside. Now, I, I was discussing this. I couldn't, I couldn't think of anybody better to go to than a nuclear physicist. And I, I thought, well, I'll... I'll just sort of put this to, to a nuclear physicist and see what he makes of it. And we're going to find out what Lawrence discovered he made of it in just a couple of minutes. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. When we left the air, we were just about to find out Something from a nuclear scientist with Lawrence. Lawrence, what was it? Okay, well, the, the first thing that he pointed out was that in all of the um, reliefs, there are duplications of this particular tube-like construction. There's always a guy on the left holding one out to the right, and there's always a guy on the right holding one out to the left, and they just about are about to touch in the middle not quite touching, just about to touch and sort of impinge on each other, the ends of these tubes. And he said quite a remarkable thing. He said, look, don't look at them, perhaps, for what you think you're seeing as the edge of them. Don't think of them as a light bulb or a cathode tube. Think of the serpent as being the key to it, and think of the serpent as if it were the words in a cartoon in a comic. And to emphasize the fact that the words are the important part, what we see is the words put into a bubble coming out of somebody's mouth. Now, the bubble is not the important thing. The bubble doesn't really exist. What exists are the words. Here, he suggested, what exists are the serpents. What is around them, think of it not as a solid object too much, because obviously it's not. There are guys with their hands and arms going straight through them as if they're, they're not there at all. Think of them as the outline. Think of them as an aura of some sort. Now, he said what actually happens is that, that once you move into the world of discussing superconductivity, which is what the white powder and the Hathor syndrome at Sinai was all about, once you move into that, you're into the realm of Meisner fields. You're into the realm of superconductive magnetic fields with no north or south polarity. If you set up Meisner fields and stick them together, what happens is that you create a flux tube, and this flux tube will become a portal, like a gateway, a stargate, into another dimension of space-time. And the theory was that that's what these could possibly be if we forget the outlines and think about them as simply being something there to inform us that, that there is within it something important. You know, there's been some very interesting research lately and listeners, if you want to follow this research, go to unknowncountry.com and put in the words parallel universe into the search engine on the left-hand side, three-quarters of the way down the site. And you will find research that suggests, A, some of it, that parallel universes may be real, and B, that there's even been a... a substance observed on a distant asteroid through telescopes that they think may actually be material from a parallel universe, that they may be, when I say real, by, I'll define my terms, they may be physically real and all around us. And maybe, therefore, the Egyptians were looking into another very real universe in this immediate area. We had... Daniel Pinchbeck on the show a few weeks ago, he, was, he is experimenting with Iboga, which is a psychedelic substance. Uh, it's the sort of thing I was never, really was never wanted for me to have on when I had my old Dreamland radio program. But now that I'm on my own, I can talk about this stuff, and I just love it. And he's fairly well convinced that he's looking at a, uh, he's looking at a, a real world when he looks through the world of these of these psychedelic subs uh, the, the the into the world that these psychedelic substances open up to him that it isn't 
the production of the mind at all, but a window into another universe. And I'm wondering if, from a vibrational standpoint, perhaps this material can literally change the way the body relates to reality. And uh, maybe you could literally, you could walk into another reality using this somehow. Does that sound at all plausible? Or be projected into it via a technology like the one we are looking at in this picture? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds entirely possible, Whitley. Um, there is an amazing amount of research going on in, in these fields at the moment. And in fact, our, our Britain's astronomer royal, Sir Martin Rees, was on the radio not so very long ago uh, talking for a good length of time about science and the current research into uh, hyperdimensions, as he calls them, parallel dimensions of space-time. Well, the stuff in your book about, about parallel dimensions is fabulous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh. it, at the moment, it seems that they, they are sort of aware of about 26 other dimensions. And the trick is being able to sort of access these dimensions at, at, at will. Um, access to the dimensions seems to be triggered by something which, which science is at the moment simply calling exotic matter. And this is quite intriguing because if, if one goes back to 1994 and, and the tests that were being done then in Arizona with these monatomic white powder substances, when the um, Institute of Advanced Studies became involved in, in it briefly, um, they were talking about its ability to actually manipulate and distort space-time. And they said it could do that because it was exotic matter. And exotic matter seems to be a, a bit of a buzzword now, and exotic yes. matter seems to be not just the key to perhaps unlocking some of these dimensions, which are crumpled. Um, I mean, I was reading something on the NASA site j just recently, and they were talking ab about the, the research that's going on now at, at various space laboratories in, in, in Britain and America, um, looking into um, the manipulation of space-time in, in order to enable spacecraft to travel enormously long distances. Uh, and they know that even at 36,000 miles an hour, it would take a spacecraft something like 80,000 years to reach the next nearest star to us. However, people would die, the fuel would run out, it's even yes. impossible, it's totally impossible. So what they've been looking at for the last few years, in fact since 1994 when, when the theory was first announced, is why don't we forget logic, why don't we think laterally on this and actually find a way of instead of moving this spacecraft and everybody in it at extraordinary speed, extraordinary speeds and killing everyone, why don't we think about moving the space-time? Taking the time in front of it and crumpling it up and expanding the time behind it so that with no acceleration, no power, in, in a flash of an instant, the spacecraft could travel light years uh, by simply manipulating the space-time. And what they're saying is the key to this is exotic matter. And all the time this exotic matter thing keeps cropping up now as being the key to everything. And what we know is that um, seven years ago, uh, this material was classified as exotic matter because it did have the ability to bend and manipulate space-time. So I, I think, you know, whether we're looking at, at the space race and whether we're looking at uh, moving through light years, whether we're looking, as we were just talking about, access into parallel dimensions, whether we're looking at its use in, in, in stealth aircraft technology uh, to enable them to move invisibly in other dimensions of space-time. What resonates all the time with me is the statement from Washington University and from NASA, which actually said, in terms of stardust, they think it'll be the biggest clue ever better than anything we've ever guessed as to actually ascertaining the workings and origin of the life force on this planet. And um, so other dimensions, what we must remember is if they're here now, they were always here. The Egyptians might not have understood the science. The Babylonians might not have used the same words that we use now. They might not have had a clue why it happened. All they knew was that certain things did happen if they did certain things. And 
they had the field of Mufkuts, for want of another word, and we know what Mufkuts was. Amazing. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about the lost science of ancient Egypt in the process of rediscovery. Remarkable. That's the word, really. Yeah. It's, it's rediscovery. It's, it's not rediscovery. a discovery. It's rediscovery. Absolutely amazing. Well, I said before that we were going to begin, we were going to get into a discussion of the Templars, and <laughs> it relates in a most remarkable way to what we are talking, what we have been talking about now. And uh, let's let's begin to talk a little bit about the Templars. And, but before we do that, there's uh, something I didn't touch on. We've touched on the possibility of movement into parallel universes, but I wanted to get back to the name of Mount Horeb, the place of flight, the mountain of flight. Uh, what about levitation and teleportation? You have some marvelous material about this in, in the book as well. And we've sort of covered it a little bit, but uh, let me just ask the straight, most straightforward possible question. Could we achieve levitation, perhaps, with using a material like this? Is this within the po realm of possibility? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's right at the forefront of possibility now. Um, <laughs> we have um, our Ministry of Defense here in Britain is working with the Department of Defense in the United States. In fact, I I in military terms, it's one of the, the things that I is in the very forefront of binding our governments together in the, at this particular time, which is why we're working so closely on the military front. Um, they are... In, in, in real terms, they're using British Aerospace in Britain and they're using Boeing in America. And, and what they're working on is, uh, with an ultimate objective of stealth technology, but they're looking at aircraft in general. And the, the theory that begins it is that, that we're moving into an age now where we're becoming terribly, well, we're in the age now where we're very environmentally conscious, we're very worried about fossil fuels, not just about the danger that they're, they're, they are to, um, to us, but about the fact that they, they won't last forever anyway. Um, so they know that they've got to find other forms of, of propulsion and fueling. Uh, now, interestingly, right to the forefront of, of fuel cell technology, uh, which is um, supposedly what's going to take over from fossil fuels, Steps not BP or Shell or any of the, the oil companies, uh, but the Anglo-American Platinum Corporation. The Anglo -Platin uh, and Platts, as they're called, are right at the forefront now of fuel cell technology, and they're working with Johnson Matthey, the precious metals dealers, and they're saying that fuel cells uh, using platinum basis will become uh, the fuel of the future. It's environment friendly, and, and what we know is that this white powder stuff um, is capable of storing any amount of energy. Any amount of energy you care to give it, it'll store. It's a bit like a room. If you fill a room up with water, it'll overflow. If you fill it up with something solid, it'll get full up. But try filling a room up with light. You can keep adding more and more and more. There is no limit to the amount of light that you can put in a space. No. And uh, so you think of a dimmer switch, you know, that you turn it on and, and the room's light and you turn it up a bit and it's brighter, it's got more light. You can keep doing that. Now, this stuff is like that. It carries energy and stores energy in the form of light waves. So a fuel cell made of this material or containing this material um, would have the ability to, to store energy. Now, what we also know um, is that it is superconductive, totally superconductive. And this is what they're interested in now in the aircraft industry because they know that not only have we got to rid ourselves of the fuels that we're using, we've got to get to a stage where aircraft travel becomes faster and yet safer. Yes. Um, they're, they're very conscious of the fact when they look at all of the records that, in fact, the, the danger periods in flying are, are generally the takeoffs and the landings. Right. And, and so question number one is, is there a way we can have aircraft travel without taking off and landing? Well, the answer is yes, as long as the plane doesn't have to touch the ground at any time. So you're looking at a hover situation. Is there an exotic matter that can create anti-gravity? Yes, there certainly is. 
And it's being worked on now. It's being worked on yes. right now as, as we talk. Now, the other interesting thing about it is that this stuff will travel in frequencies. Once you have a fuel cell made of this, it's just like turning on the radio. It's just like we're talking now, or, or as your listeners will be listening to, to the show. All around us, there are frequencies and wave bands. We don't see them, but within them, there are pictures moving around through the Internet. There are voices moving across the oceans. All of this stuff is happening within frequencies and wave bands. Now, this stuff will travel in frequencies. So if you actually have an aircraft, which is now levitational, uh, uh, and Lawrence? you set it in a frequency Lawrence? and turn the button, away it goes. We're going to have to take a little brief break, and when we get back, we will continue with this discussion of anti-gravity and I also want to get into the whole concept of sacred science since this ancient and incredibly potent science is in the process of being rediscovered and along with it uh, an exit door has appeared we may be able to get out of here off this planet very soon and in some extraordinary ways this is Whitley Strieber it's dreamland we'll be right back This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. We've been talking to Lawrence Gardner, the author of Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, Amazing Revelations of the Incredible Power of Gold. And indeed, this has proved to be a truly amazing experience as this brilliant and extraordinary man creates or points the way to a synthesis between the lost ancient science of Egypt and the very leading edge of modern science in fuel cell technology, in even in the movement between, possibly movement between dimensions, teleportation, levitation, an explosive new edge is created. We have a new event horizon in our world. But this is incredibly powerful stuff, Lawrence. And in the past, this was a sacred science carefully uh, uh, operated in the context of constant awareness of the presence of, quote-unquote, the gods. Maybe the presence of the very real beings in other dimensions. How do you respond to that? Um. Uh, my answer is yes. I mean, I, I'm open to anything, Whitley. No, I, no. I mean, j just to finish off the last point. Just oh, sure. A few words. The aeroplane is now anti-gravitational. It's put into a frequency. The button is turned up, just like turning on the radio, and off it goes. It can be sped up or slowed down within yes. the frequency, but it can't fall out of it. It can never fall out of the frequency. It's anti-gravitational. It's moving in this wave. So what you have is... is um, safe aircraft and they don't actually they won't need pilots that they'll simply be things that they can just send like we send radio waves um so that's what they're working on now as far as um that i mean i started off this this research of mine oh i don't know 10 12 years ago whatever it was as, as a very straightforward art historian yes and gradually i mean i've learned as i've gone along to to, to really not do what academia teaches us and to put things into boxes and to close your mind and to separate science from medicine and medicine from history and history from mathematics and mathematics from religion. They seem to me to be all the same thing. And once you knock down the edges of the boxes, all things seem to become possible. Uh, and they interlink and we have one subject, one overall subject, and it has different aspects. Now, it seems that this is really what the priests of olden times understood much better than our tutors do today. Um, they might not have known so much about various things uh, because the discoveries have been made as we've gone along, but what we do know is that there were technologies that they had and that they were using that we never, ever would have credited them with. And since then, we've been learning more and more about what the ancients knew about the ancient world, and people like Lawrence Gardner and William Henry are actually cracking some of those codes as 2006 becomes 2007. It's a very, very exciting time to be alive. And speaking of William Henry, he'll be interviewing next week. Jay Widener has a new DVD out. He's an extremely popular guest on Dreamland. 
Don't miss Jay Widener next week. And I'm going to be talking to William Mann, who was on Dreamland a few weeks ago, about an absolutely remarkable subject. William Mann, as you know, comes from a Templar family, actually, who have a family history in the Templars in Canada that's documented that goes back hundreds of years. He thinks he met the Master of the Key also, and so do, do not miss that if you're a subscriber. Um, what happened was that as time progressed and the European Common Market and then the European Union as it became was formed, a European Parliament emerged. So at that time, um, the, the title was changed um, from the International Council of Government to become the Council of Princes. And what it's actually done really for the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years is to act as a, a constitutional advisory body. Um, if, for example, the Brussels Parliament issues a dictate to the countries in the European Union, uh, it's the Council that will sit in judgment, really, and sort of look at the various constitutions of the countries involved and go back and say, well, look, you can implement that here, but you can't implement it there because the Constitution doesn't allow you to. So I it's, see. it's an advisory Council. I see. Well, in any case, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, and it's a most most interesting and unusual uh, process. I can't resist, and I, I want to get right to the meat of the book, but A Knight Templar of St. Anthony, what is that? It's very possibly, and I'm not absolutely sure, but it's probably about the oldest order of Knights Templars currently um, still operating, and it was founded in the time of Mary Queen of Scots for Mary Queen of Scots. So it's a branch of the Knights Templars that was set up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. In fact, originally it was set up in France because she was Queen of France for a while um, before she came to Scotland, and then um, it became the sort of key Scottish order of Knights Templars in, in the 1500s. Well, we will be getting, of course, later in the, in, the, in the interview very deeply into the whole matter of the Knights Templar, and we will be getting into it with a man who knows his certainly knows his his stuff. But let's begin by going back 99 years and many thousands of years at the same time. Sir W.M. Flinders Petrie stood upon a wind-torn rocky plateau in the Sinai Desert. Thus begins a story that eclipses Indiana Jones. Had a great deal did happen to me, which I've described in my journals and uh, on uh, the show at various times, and it was weird. The only thing about this is there's two things that you've got to realize. First, there's a lot of white powder gold for sale on the Internet. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is, and they don't know necessarily what it is. Some of them perhaps do. We're going to have Lawrence Gardner on again in March. He's got a new book out, and Jim Mars is going to interview him. I'm going to interview him. We're going to have a load of fun. We're going to ask him all the latest about white powder gold. But remember this, any heavy metal that you ingest is dangerous for your kidneys. So don't take a lot of that if you're going to take any of it at all. I mean, I was just tried it for a couple of weeks, and uh, that was it. I was very, very careful with it, and you should be too. I might add for you subscribers that in the subscriber section, there is an interview, a special interview for subscribers only, with Barry Carter, who makes white powder gold and discusses it and his research into it and what it may be and what making of it in, entails. It's really fascinating stuff. So go to the, well, the way you get to it is you go to the special interviews section, then click on the special interviews archive, and then search on the word Carter. And Barry Carter, I think it's from May, or no, I guess it's from December, excuse me, of 2003. It's in there. And, folks, those of you who don't subscribe, there's really a wealth of information in that subscriber section, stuff you just absolutely do not see elsewhere, like what I was just talking about. You're never, you won't find that elsewhere. It doesn't exist. So do look for it, uh, those of you who are subscribers and those of you who aren't. Well, click on the Subscribe tab and subscribe. You can get Lawrence Gardner's uh, Law Secrets of the Sacred Ark on our website, of course, and you can store, and you will be able to get his new book in March. And it's very exciting stuff. Uh, it's always fun that Lawrence Gardner is coming to come back with us. So let's listen to him now talking about white powder gold from 2003. Introduce you once again to one of the greats, Lawrence Gardner, extraordinarily unusual 
Precious Lawrence, also, of course, as well as author of Bloodline of the Holy Grail. He's author of Realm of the Ring Lords and Genesis of the Grail Kings. Now, Lawrence, could you tell me a little bit about what some of these titles actually mean? For example, what is the Chevalier, uh, a cheval, the Chevalier de Saint-Germain? What does this mean? It's actually a title which um, has been around for the longest time, actually. The, the first knight of Saint-Germain was um, Robert the Bruce in the year 1307. And subsequently what happened was that um, as the House of Stuart progressed from Robert the Bruce and became the Stuart Kings of Scotland and then Britain, uh, the sort of chief chamberlain to the House of Stuart was always granted that title, um, the Saint-Germain title, Count of Saint-Germain, Chevalier Saint-Germain, Knight of Saint-Germain, or whatever. And so in, in a sort of, not exactly a hereditary lineage, but in a lineage of chancellors to, to the House of Stuart, um, I was given the title back in 1992, um, the year that I was appointed to the European Council of Princes to be the sort of key historiographer for the uh, council. And what is the European Council of Princes? It's um, a conglomeration, really, of, of royal houses in Europe. It was founded in 1946 after the Second World War, and, and the object really was that the, the royal houses, whether they were reigning royal houses or past royal houses, deposed or whatever, but the, the, the various um, sons, really, the princes of the, of the royal houses, got together and formed a council there was a lot of funding at the time from America, oddly enough, for this, and, and the, the, the ambition was to sort of prevent, again, the rise in Europe of extreme um, political factions like the fascist um, movement that had uh, been battled against at that time, or indeed even communism at the other end, perhaps. Um, and it was called at the time the International Council of Government. Gardner talking about white powder gold one of the most interesting dreamlands I think I can ever remember doing. Upcoming in the new year, we've got all kinds of cool stuff happening. John Hogue, our resident prophet, is going to be back with us, and plus he's going to be in the subscriber section talking to you live uh, about your prophecy ideas and your expectations for the new year and what does he have to prophesy about your life? Join our live chat with John Hogue as soon as it's scheduled in January. We've got so much going at so many different levels. Dreamland is going to be an exciting year ahead, believe you me. It's nearly, I think it's my ninth year doing Dreamland. It's hard to believe that I've been doing it that long because every week it feels like it's just starting for the first time and that's what, why uh, I love it so much. I'm just fascinated. The things we've got coming up, uh, a new book on catastrophes that explains what actually happened 13,000 years ago that blew this whole planet into a cocked hat. Amazing work of scientists, and this is not speculation at all. Careful scientists have gone around the world examining the debris they will tell us exactly what changed our world so profoundly, what maybe brought about the end of Atlantis. Uh, it, just amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, there's the Blue Pearl uh, meditation up on the website. Don't miss that if you're a subscriber to unknowncountry.com. There's real energy there. And you know, I always talk about 2012, and I say to people, well, people say to me, what's going to happen? And I say, well, maybe... Nothing for most people, but for those who are willing to open their minds, maybe everything. Be willing to open your mind. You know, after I talked to Lawrence Gardner about white powder gold, I took white powder gold for a few weeks, and then nothing seemed to happen. And then a few months after that, the of Bloodline of the Holy Grail has been with us a number of times, and it has always been beyond exciting. It's one of those interviews that usually brings me to my feet. Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark is very simply one of the most stunning and frankly out-and-out -out brilliant books I have ever read. This is not going to be a hostile interview. <laughs> I think you can, you can probably sense that. I am over the moon about this book, and Lawrence is a 
a tremendous writer and a tremendous thinker, and he has created in this some extraordinary and exciting insights, and we're going to really have some fun. The subtitle of the book is Amazing Revelations of the Incredible Power of Gold. And, wow, are we going to get into the inner workings of a lost science today. So hang on. Welcome, Lawrence, to the program. Hello there, Whitley. Well, it's so wonderful to have you again. I think that everybody listening to this program knows exactly who Lawrence Gardner is. But just in case there are a few of you out there who don't, do not know what this great leader of this community, this loose community of people willing to tempt the edge of thought and, and exploration, who he is. He is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. He's a constitutional historian, lecturer. He's a broadcaster, as he will be showing you today. He's, a disting he's distinguished as a Chevalier de Saint-Germain. He is attached to the European Council of Princes as the Jacobite Historiographer Royal. He has been a conservation consultant to the Fine Arts Trade Guild, and his, work, his musical work has been performed in London's Royal Opera House, he is a Knight Templar of the Prior of, of St. Anthony and the Prior of the Sacred Kindred of St. Columba. A most 